Hello. Today I would like to estimate the number of atoms in the observable universe by using a series of observations of the night sky along with some basic classical physics. In order to estimate the number of atoms in the observable universe, I am going to assume that the vast majority of atoms live inside stars and that those stars live inside galaxies. With these assumptions, our calculation can be broken down into a number of steps. The first step is to estimate the number of atoms in a typical star, and we will use the Sun as an example of a typical star. The second step would be to estimate the number of stars in a typical galaxy, and we will use the Milky Way galaxy as an example of a typical galaxy. The third step is going to be to estimate the number of galaxies in the observable universe, and we're going to use the Hubble Deep Field image in order to do this. Finally, with all of this information, we can put it all together and arrive at a value, an estimate for the number of atoms in the observable universe. Our first step is to estimate the number of atoms in the Sun. In order to do this, we need to calculate the mass of the Sun, and our approach is going to involve using Newton's universal law of gravitation along with circular motion. In the diagram you can see the Sun, which has a mass ms, the Earth, which has a mass me, and the distance between the Earth and Sun is given by r, which is the radius. Furthermore, we're going to assume that the Earth is moving in a circle around the Sun with a constant speed, v meters per second. Newton's universal law of gravitation says that the force acting between the Earth and Sun is proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance. So we can write F equals G M E M S divided by R squared. And this is Newton's famous inverse square law relationship. G is the gravitational constant. Given the fact that we're assuming the Earth is moving in a circle, that means that the Earth is accelerating because the direction is constantly changing. And therefore the gravitational force is acting as the centripetal force causing the Earth to move in a circle. This tells us that the Earth, with its mass Me, is going to be accelerating with an acceleration equal to the velocity squared divided by the radius. Now that we have this expression, we can rearrange for ms, and this will give us an equation which will allow us to calculate the mass of the Sun. Firstly, we notice that me cancels from both sides, and if we multiply both sides by r squared, we're going to get gms equals v squared r squared divided by r, and we see that the r's cancel, leaving one r on the top, and if we divide both sides by g, we're going to find ms equals v squared r divided by g. Next, we want to replace v with an expression involving r and t, where t is the time it takes for the Earth to complete one orbit around the Sun. Given that we're considering that the Earth is moving with a constant speed, we know that the speed is going to be equal to the distance divided by the time. Now, the distance around one complete orbit is simply the circumference of the circle of radius r. And so this is going to be equal to 2 pi r. And the time taken for the Earth to complete one orbit is simply what we call the time period. In the case of the Earth, that's just one year. So now we have an expression for v which is 2 pi, divide, 2 pi r divided by t, and we can substitute this expression into the equation above where we see v. And therefore we can write ms equals, and instead of v I'm going to write 2 pi r divided by t, and that's squared times r divided by g. We can now simplify this expression, and we find that the mass of the sun is going to be equal to 4 pi squared divided by g times r cubed over t squared. 
and this is simply Kepler's third law and notice that we can now calculate the mass of the Sun if we know the radius of the Earth's orbit around the Sun and the time it takes for the Earth to complete an orbit around the Sun. Now that we have an equation for the mass of the Sun in terms of the radius of the Earth orbit and the time period of the Earth orbit, all we need to do is substitute in values for r and t in order to find a numerical value for the mass of the Sun. Thankfully, the measurement of the distance to the Sun and the time it takes to orbit the Sun are known to a high degree of accuracy. I'm going to take the radius of the Earth orbit to be approximately 150 million kilometers. And furthermore, the time period, which is simply the time it takes for the Earth to complete one orbit, is one year. But we need to express this in meters, and that's going to be equal to 365 days times 24 hours times 60 minutes in an hour times 60 seconds in a minute and that gives a value of about 3.15 times 10 to the 7 seconds. We're going to express our radius in meters and this is about 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. Now that we have these two expressions we just need to substitute them into the equation and we find that the mass of the Sun is approximately equal to 1.77 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. Now that we have the mass of the Sun in kilograms, we need to estimate how many atoms make up that mass. One thing we know about stars is that the vast majority of a star is comprised of hydrogen atoms. So an estimate of the number of atoms inside a star will be given by the mass of the star divided by the mass of a single hydrogen atom. And that's what we're going to do. So therefore we can say that the number of atoms is going to be roughly equal to 1.77 times 10 to the 30 divided by the mass of a single hydrogen, which is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27. And this gives a value of approximately 1 times 10 to the 57 atoms. And so we're going to assume that a typical star contains around 10 to the power 57 atoms. This ends our first step. In this second part, we are going to estimate the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. In order to do this, we are going to assume that the vast majority of the mass of the Milky Way is concentrated in a uniform sphere at the centre of the galaxy. You can see two sketches here of the Milky Way galaxy viewed from the side and viewed from above to give you an idea of what the spiral galaxy looks like from these two different perspectives. And we're going to assume that most of the mass of this entire galaxy is concentrated in this sphere at the centre. The reason we're doing this is because then we can use Kepler's third law, much like in the previous example, to write down an expression for the mass of the galaxy as being equal to 4 pi squared divided by g times r cubed divided by t squared. Now, in this case, r represents the distance from the centre of the gal galaxy to the location of the sun, which we could, for example, assume is here. And if this is the centre of the galaxy, then r represents this distance. T represents the time it takes for the Sun to complete one orbit of the galactic centre. Now detailed measurements suggest that the Sun rotates around the galactic centre at a distance of 30,000 light years. In other words we can say that R is equal to 30,000 light years. And a light year is the distance that light travels in one year. And so we can convert this expression, 30,000 light years, into meters by using the definition of a light year. So that's going to be 30,000 times 
the distance that light travels in one year, well, the distance that light travels will be equal to the speed of light multiplied by the number of seconds in a year. So the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and the number of seconds in a year is simply 365 times 24 times 60 times 60. And if we put this into your calculator, you'll find that the radius of the sun's orbit around the galactic center is about 2.84 times 10 to the 20 meters. Other calculations and measurements suggest that the time it takes for the sun to complete one orbit of the galactic center, t, is equal to 200 million years. And so we need to convert this into seconds. And in order to do that, we can write 200 million as 200 times 10 to the power of 6 years. And the number of seconds in one year is simply 365 times 24 times 60 times 60. And again, if you put this into your calculator, you find that t is equal to 6.3 times 10 to the 15 seconds. Now that we have a value for r and a value for t, we can substitute these values into our equation and calculate what the mass of the galaxy is. And we find that the mass of a galaxy is equal to 3.41 times 10 to the 41 kilograms. And this is an approximate value for the mass of the Milky Way galaxy. If we want to know the number of stars inside the Milky Way galaxy, we can estimate this because the number of stars is going to be equal to the mass of the galaxy, which is 3.41 times 10 to the 41, divided by the mass of a typical star. And we saw in part one that the mass of a typical star was about 1.77 times 10 to the 30. And so if you put this into your calculator, you find that the number of stars in the Milky Way, Milky Way galaxy is around 2 times 10 to the 11. And this is the value that we're going to use. Now that we've estimated the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy, we know the number of atoms in a typical star. And therefore, we can calculate the number of atoms in the Milky Way is going to be equal to the number of stars we've estimated in the Milky Way, 2 times 10 to the 11, multiplied by the number of atoms in a typical star, which was 1 times 10 to the 57. And this gives an estimate of the number of atoms in the Milky Way of 2 times 10 to the 68. And this is the value that we're going to use. Now that we've estimated how many atoms are in a typical galaxy, we need to try and estimate how many galaxies there are in the observable universe. And that's our next part. Our final task is to estimate the number of galaxies in the observable universe. In 2004, the Hubble Space Telescope took a million second exposure photograph of a small part of the night sky. To get a sense of just how small the region of sky was, I've drawn a picture in which the moon is shown to scale. The small box labeled HDF represents the region of space that the Hubble Space Telescope focused on. Compared to the size of a full moon, it is a tiny region of the night sky. What's more, to the naked eye it appears that this region is completely empty of stars or galaxies or anything interesting. However, over several days of exposure, a faint image began to form that would change the way we saw the universe forever. This image is known as the Hubble Deep Field. Every single smudge of light in this image is an entire galaxy, containing hundreds of billions of stars. Computers have been used to count the number of galaxies in this image, and it's been found that there are around 10,000 galaxies. When measuring the distance between two objects in space, one often measures what is called the angular distance. This corresponds to the angle that would be made if you were to draw lines from the two objects back to an observer on Earth. The standard unit of angular distance is the degree. As you know, 
there are 360 degrees in a full circle. As an example, the angular distance between an object on the horizon and one that was directly overhead would be 90 degrees. However, when dealing with astronomical observations made through a telescope, one often deals with tiny fractions of a degree. To make things simpler, astronomers use units known as arc minutes and arc seconds. There are 60 arc seconds in one arc minute and 60 arc minutes in one degree. As you can see in this diagram, the Hubble Deep Field image covers an angular distance of about one arc minute on either side, or one sixtieth of a degree. Given that there are 10,000 galaxies in this image, in order to calculate the number of galaxies in the observable universe, we need to ask the question, how many of these small tiles, each one sixtieth of a degree by one sixtieth of a degree, make up the entire sky? And if we assume that each tile contains 10,000 galaxies, then the number of tiles multiplied by 10,000 will give us the number of galaxies in the observable universe. And we're going to now perform that calculation. In order to determine how many Hubble Deep Field sized tiles fit into the night sky, we need to calculate the area of the night sky in square degrees. We know that the surface area of a sphere is equal to 4 pi r squared. And we want to express the radius in terms of degrees. And the way that we can do this is by considering a circle of radius r. If we then consider an arc length equal to r with an angle theta, we then see that the circumference of the circle divided by r, namely 2 pi r divided by r, is going to be equal to 360 degrees divided by theta. And therefore, if we rearrange, we see that theta is equal to 360 divided by 2 pi, which is equal to 57.29 degrees. And so when the arc length is equal to r, we see that theta is equal to 57.29. And this is what we will use for our radius when measured in degrees. And therefore we can say that the area of the night sky, which is equal to 4 pi r squared, can be written as 4 pi times 57.29 degrees squared. And if you put that in your calculator, you find a value of 4.13 times 10 to the 4 square degrees. And this represents the area of the night sky. Now, the Hubble Deep Field image is a square which has side length of 1 60th of a degree. And therefore, if each side is 1 60th of a degree, then the area of the Hubble Deep Field image will be equal to 1 60th of a degree times 1 60th of a degree, which is 1 over 3,600 square degrees. And so, in order to calculate how many tiles make up the entire night sky, we simply need to divide the total square degree area of the night sky by the area of the Hubble Deep Field image. And so therefore, number of tiles is equal to 4.13 times 10 to the 4 divided by 1 over 3,600 and if you put that in your calculator, you find 148,680,000. So that's the number of tiles required to fill the entire night sky. And we've seen that there are approximately 10,000 galaxies in each tile. And therefore, an approximation for the number of galaxies in the observable universe will be the number of tiles multiplied by the number of galaxies in each tile, and therefore the number of galaxies will be roughly equal to 10,000, which is the number of galaxies in one tile, multiplied by 148,680,000, and this gives a value of close to 1.5 times 10 to the 12 galaxies, or 
1.5 trillion galaxies in the observable universe. We are now in a position to combine our calculations from the previous three sections and arrive at an estimate for the number of atoms in the observable universe. We've already seen that the number of atoms in a typical star is around 10 to the 57, the number of stars in a typical galaxy around 10 to the 11, and the number of galaxies in the observable universe around 10 to the 12. And therefore, to determine the number of atoms in the observable universe, we just need to multiply these numbers together. So the number of atoms is going to be equal to 10 to the 57 times 10 to the 11 times 10 to the 12. And we arrive at an estimate of 10 to the 80 atoms in the observable universe. And this ends our calculation. I hope you've enjoyed the video.